and welcome to the third 2012 workshop series of the Vancouver Mindful Living series that is sponsored by BCACC. And this is a community service project initiated by BCACC and our member services chair, Lida Izadi, who is... Where is she? She's downstairs, I don't believe. She's, ah. <laughs> see, she's always working, always working. And, um, so, and we are very grateful to the Adler School of Professional Psychology for providing this wonderful room and all the facilities and the great um, um, projection and screen and everything else, um, which we otherwise would not be able to provide. So thank you all for coming out tonight. And um, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Patrick Myers. And he will be speaking on chronic pain management, is that correct? And Patrick has been working in the field of pain management for a number of years. He received his training during his PhD internship with the Workers' Compensation Board in Edmonton. And apparently fell in love with the wet coast here. Oh, I was <laughs> falling in love with the west coast way oh. before that. <laughs> okay. And I'm confident you will enjoy his presentation. Thank you very much. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Everybody, how are you doing? Good. Good. <laughs> My name is Patrick Myers, and uh, I'm working at a place called Complement Healthcare, which is actually on the other side of the pond, although I do do a little bit of uh, counseling over on this side of the pond. I'm working mostly over in West Van, which is the first phone number here, uh, if you're at all interested. I'm also working over there with a lady by the name of Deb Braun. Uh, and she will be doing a presentation here. I'm not exactly sure when the schedule is, but she'll be doing a presentation here on living with chronic illness, and uh, she's a great speaker as well, so I very much invite you for that. Um, let's see, one of the things I want to put out is, are there people here with chronic pain tonight? A couple of you, yes, okay. So if you have chronic pain, feel free to squirm around, stand up, sit down, lie down, move around, whatever you need to do to make yourself feel comfortable, okay? That's really important here. All right, um, so basically I'm gonna talk a little bit about pain. Unfortunately, this presentation is extremely jam-packed with an awful lot of information. Uh, this presentation, uh, this presentation would normally take me several sessions of therapy to, to deal with, with when I'm playing with a client. Hello? Ah, oh, yeah, sure, we'll go into there. Uh, and now this isn't working. There we go. I think we're working now. So it's going to get jammed into a very small space of time, so it may get a little confusing. So basically, I'm going to talk a little bit about pain. Uh, there are two types of pain that we normally talk about. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, pacing and what I call the ABCDEFs of pain management. And then I'm going to finish off a little bit with stigma, which Dr. Williamson informed us about. So. All right. I also want to thank the uh, BC Association of Clinical Counselors for inviting me for this presentation, and the Adler School, of course. I'm a huge believer in coming out and giving these kinds of presentations. I do them all over the place, not always with BCACC, uh, but I'm a huge believer in trying to get this kind of information out to people uh, if this is of use to people. All right. Here we go, Ashlyn Blocker. Looks like a beautiful little five-year-old book girl. However, she is a one in a million kind of person. She is one in a million because she has a very strange disease. It's called congenital insensitivity to pain. And it's caused by a genetic mutation, whatever that is. Um, 
One of the things that Ashlyn cannot do is, is that she can't feel pain, which means things like if she breaks a leg, she can't feel that. If she has an appendix rupture, she can't feel that. All right? She can't feel fevers, these kinds of things. She also can't smell. So she can't smell if a house is on fire. She can't smell if the food is rotten. People with this kind of genetic mutation generally don't live into adulthood because infections and numerous other things get to them eventually. As you can see in this picture, she is daily checked for injuries and whatnot. Uh, and so, luckily, the good news is at age, how old is she in this picture? Age 11. And this picture is about two years old now, I think. Um, so I think she's about 13 now. She <coughs> is uh, doing quite nicely. She's a very active young lady. And she is also helping in the search for the perfect painkiller. So you have Dr. Roland Stout in the background there. He's examining her genetic mutation, trying to see if there's something that can be withdrawn from that for a painkiller. So there's lots of room on this side of the room, too, if you want. Come on over if you like. Oh, that, I, I, sorry, I was also asked to inform people that it's only getting the back of your heads, but be aware that this is being videotaped, all right? Um, and we hope to be able to put this on YouTube and they'll be able to go to the Clinical Counselors uh, uh, Association. They'll have a link to this video. So if you like this video, you can tell your friends. If I'm going way too fast here, you can watch me in slow motion and all that kind of stuff, okay? All right, here's a fun little quote from Walt Kelly, a.k.a. Pogo, an agnostic is someone who doesn't know, and die is Greek for and two. And so therefore, diagnostic is someone who doesn't know twice as much as an agnostic doesn't know. <laughs> um, I want to put it out that, uh, you know, I was presented as an expert in pain, but if you are suffering from chronic pain, you are much more an expert than I am. All right, so, okay. Generally, when we consider the senses, we consider the five basic senses, and I'm going to suggest that actually pain is another sense, and I would hazard that pain was the original sense. So, I'm gonna present this idea that pain is a sixth sense. What does acute pain do? So if I am walking along and I step on a thumbtack, ouch, what does that do? Well, it warns of impending tissue damage or it warns of actual tissue damage. If I stood on a thumbtack, I wouldn't just stand there and go, oh, that feels good. I'd do something. I'd probably jump up and jump up and down and all this kind of stuff. So I'd actually be doing something about it. So it causes us to withdraw from the thing that causes us pain. It would encourage us to rest and heal so that we don't keep using the foot when it's injured. It would teach us to be a little more careful in the future of walking on particular floors with lots of thumbtacks on them. And the basic the purpose of acute pain is survival. And so that's why I call pain the original sixth sense, is because it's there to promote survival. So acute pain uh, lasts for a particular period of time, depending on the amount of injury that occurs. So generally we consider that pain would last maybe a few seconds to up to perhaps six months depending on the nature of the injury and the speed of healing. Uh, this kind of pain, the acute pain, if I step on a thumbtack, generally responds to some form of care such as massage, rest, medication, surgery, or immobilization. 
You guys want me to read this little comic, or can everyone read the comic? Mm -hmm. Everyone can read the comic? Mm -hmm. All right. There's plenty of room over on this side of the room if you would like, so make yourself comfy. Generally what happens, as you can see from this picture, generally what happens is, is that acute pain is there for a reason. It's trying to say, okay, we need to heal, we need to take some time to heal. And eventually, once healing takes place, then the pain goes down. The problem is then we deal with something else, which a few of you are dealing with in this room, and that is something called chronic pain. For some reason, it doesn't go away. And unfortunately, I'm going to say sadly, we don't quite understand entirely why it doesn't go away. All we know is that it's there. It's a pain in the butt, too. All right. Persisting pain is a very common ailment. About a third of Canadians. Wow. A third of Canadians, chronic pain. Persisting pain. I'm going to say some rather controversial things. Hold off a moment here. All right. Before you jump down my throat. Persisting pain. It doesn't serve a purpose. It doesn't serve a purpose. In other words, the hurt that you feel does not equal harm. It does not equal damage. Right? Unfortunately, the pain persists. The pain, instead of being a symptom, of something now becomes the main problem. There are complex causes of pain and unfortunately pain does not respond well to medical <coughs> intervention. Um, sorry, I should have noted this also. I'm noticing that there are some people writing down notes here. Uh, that's useful to write down these notes. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't know how many people were coming here, and my printer is down right now. I do have handouts on this, and if you keep an eye out here, you'll see that I put my email address down here. You're welcome to email me. Please, in the subject line, put pain handouts, because if you put something else in there, I'm really paranoid about my inbox, and I throw a lot of people into the spam box, okay? So, if you want to email me and ask for the handouts, you're more than welcome to do so. But put in the subject headline, put pain handouts or something to that effect, okay? And you're more than welcome to write notes to you. All right. This is more uh, acute pain that this is talking about. Okay, so what I've got following here are a couple of different diagrams that different people have used to explain pain. This is my diagram that I use to explain pain. It also explains other things as well, but one of the things that it does explain is pain. And what you see here is you see that there are four things. There's the action, there's the thinking, there's your feeling, and there is your body. And I'm going to say, that's it, and that's all there is to life. Now, I am not that radical thinking that I know everything here. If I were a medical doctor, obviously I'd have to put in genetics here. If I was a priest, I'd have to put in spirituality here. I'm neither of those, so I'm going to offer this as my model of what life is about. And you will notice that the body is interconnected with your actions. If you have pain, you are likely going to limit your behaviors, right? If you have pain, you're not going to be a happy camper. You're going to be very upset. And you may even be prone, and we find this a lot, we find that a lot of people with pain are somewhat prone to having depressive bouts, right? 
Yeah, of course. You've got all this pain. Of course you do. And of course, the pain is also going to affect your thinking as well. Right? So, here's another little diagram. It talks about pain and anxiety. Sleep is a big, big connector to pain. And of course, the inability to cope. So this is another picture of the chronic pain cycle. And then the last but not least, we have this picture, a very complex picture, which has a whole bunch of components in it. And that is that when you have pain, you're inclined not to move. All right? But when we don't move, then what happens is there has a tendency of being muscle deterioration, there has a tendency to be a risk of re-injury, and all these kinds of things, muscle spasms, and all this kind of stuff. So to some degree, there's more pain. Well, what happens then is we get all kinds of other things that are incorporated. So pain is not something that's really simple. What happens? We're given drugs, and then after a while, the drugs don't work. There's what we call habituation. What else we got? Quite often, uh, Lita was talking about uh, WCB, and quite often there are problems with income, your job. There is deconditioning, there's weight gain, insomnia, all these kinds of things. There are the fact that the disappointment of the medical establishment not being able to help you, but it's not just the medical establishment. It's also uh, lawyers, government agencies, all this kind of stuff. You have family difficulties that sometimes arise as a result of uh, persisting pain. And of course, there is withdrawal from social activity, depression, all this kind of stuff. And this leads to a vicious circle of anxiety, tension, more tension, more pain, more pain, more anxiety, more tension, more pain. And it's a vicious cycle. Long-term use of medications. Of course, we have to be a little bit careful of long-term use of medications. With the opiates, we risk things like tolerance. That means that a certain level of drug, we become habituated to it. It doesn't work for us anymore. Now we need more drug, right? There is withdrawal from opiates. There is immune suppression as a result of opiates. And of course, respiratory depression. With NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. We have all kinds of wild things like ulcers, kidney and liver damage, high blood pressure, strokes, and other drug interactions. So what happens if I prick myself with a tack or something like that? What happens? There are certain sensors that are going to become activated in my finger, or if I step on a tack, there are certain sensors that are going to be activated in my foot. These sensors are then going to send an electrochemical uh, signal up my hand, up my arm, into my spinal column, and from there it goes into the brain. From the brain, it gets distributed to all kinds of different places, and these electrochemical signals keep on going along, and eventually what happens is that something goes, oops, this isn't right, and then there is an electrochemical signal that comes from the brain, travels through the brain, down to the brain, uh, down to the spinal column, down into my arm, and it makes my arm jerk away, or it makes my foot jerk away from what I've just stepped on, okay? This all happens very, very quickly. Quite often, we aren't even conscious of this entire process. What happens then is that eventually, the electrochemical signals keep on working their way through the brain, and the 
brain then starts interpreting these things, and it brings an interpretation to these things of, ouch, that hurts. Well, that's fine and dandy when we have pinprick, but what happens when we have chronic pain? So here's a little picture. This is a real technical picture. We don't have to worry about this too much. But again, this is showing the transmission of signals from one cell to the next cell, crossing something called the synaptic gap. These big technical words for those who are in school will know all about that. I don't really worry about it too much, except for the fact that what we have here is we have an electrochemical signal that is coursing through your brain and through your body. Okay? Now, the brain also has all kinds of other things that it is trying to process. It's not just processing the pain. <coughs> it's also trying to process your five senses. It's also trying to process the fact that if I stand on one leg, I have to try and balance myself. So there's something here in my inner ear that's keeping me balanced. There are things that are things like temperature, cool, warm. How many people are hot in here? How many people are cool right now? I'm a little bit of a reptile, so I'm always cold. Um, there are your kinesthetic senses. There are your internal sensations. I feel hungry. Right? I feel sleepy. All these kinds of things. There is your social environment. Your brain is trying to interpret all this stuff. And so there are all these inputs coming into your brain. They're all coming via these electrochemical signals. And what does the brain do? brain is interpreting all these. So what is pain? Pain is information that is carried uh, in the nervous system. Sorry, the information that is carried in the nervous system is not the pain. What it is, is it's an electrochemical signal. The brain attempts to interpret all these signals and then it does something with all this stuff. So, you would have things like, I'm hungry, you would have things like emotions. These are all just electrochemical signals. And so too is pain, an electrochemical signal. <clears throat> so of course, right about now, anybody who has chronic pain should be jumping out of their seat, ready to pummel me, right? <laughs> like, are you nuts? Are you saying? that the pain is an interpretation by my brain that I'm just imagining my pain? Are you saying that if I'm just imagining my pain, well, I can just think it away again? Are you saying that I'm crazy? And the answer is a very emphatic no. Your pain is very real. And for those of us who are clinical counselors, one of the things that you have to do that is the most service to your clients is believe them. Their pain is real. Very real. All right? Here's a little picture. Unfortunately, I couldn't, um, in time for this presentation, download. I found a new picture, which was even cooler. But here's a little picture. It's brain scan of Pain. Here's pain in the brain. This is what it looks like. It's lighting up certain areas of the brain. Right? What this picture was really cool, what I really liked about this picture was it was showing emotional pain and physical pain. And guess what? They overlapped. Right? So when you're feeling emotional pain, you're basically triggering the same places in your brain for the most part as you are in physical pain. The pain is very real. Your pain is very real, and it's important to acknowledge our clients for their pain. <laughs> oh, are we reading our books? Yeah, we're running, <laughs> reading the funnies, yes. We've got to read those too, right? However, one of the things that I'm going to say is that with persisting pain, with chronic pain, is, is that somewhere in the interpretation, somewhere in the transmission, 
something has gone haywire. Unfortunately, we don't know what it is. We cannot give you a good description of why you're having chronic pain, why our clients are having chronic pain. But to some degree, we have to be a little careful of believing that this is it and this is all, all it'll ever be. So I use some examples here of things that, where our brain can to some degree be misguided by the interpretation <coughs> of making. Put on a pair of rose-colored glasses. How does the world start to look? Uh, what's another one? Has anybody ever gone down to the States and read their paper, their newspaper? Some people have. And then you read the BBC. Wow, what a different perspective on the world, huh? And then you read, uh, what's the Arab one? Al Jazeera. Holy cow, they're all talking about the same thing. How is that possible? Right? It's the interpretation. Uh, drugs and alcohol. What happens when we have a drink? We feel better. We start acting differently. Right? Again, interpretations. So there's two pictures here, and that is just that one of these individuals is a guitar player, and he gets a sliver in his finger. What's going to happen to that individual? That pain is going to be very significant. That pain is going to cause a lot of anxiety. Because how am I supposed to play the guitar now? Compared to a carpenter, who's used to banging his thumb, used to banging his fingers, right? The carpenter is going to jump up and down, go, oh! and maybe a few other words. But it's part of the job. And so they're just going to keep on going. Interpretation. Would you trust this man? How about now? <laughs> it's all in the perspective, isn't it? Uh, placebo effect. I'm not going to go talk a lot about this, but there's a fellow by the name of Benedetti uh, who does a lot of research on the placebo effect. And there's a demonstrable effect with placebo and pain. There is uh, a book out that I'm sure lots of people who know about this book is, uh, I think it's called The Brain that changes by Norman Deutsch, is that what it is? Yeah, okay, all right. And so, the brain that changes itself, thank you very much, yes. And one of the people that Norman Deutsch talks about is about a fellow by the name of Ramachandra. So, basically back in the, up until the uh, mid-90s, we didn't understand, we didn't realize that this stuff existed. And Ramachandra blew open the doors of our reality. And basically what happened is Ramachandran had a client who came in whose limb had been cut off, <coughs> but was experiencing phantom limb pain. And basically what it felt like to this individual, how he described it to Ramachandran, was that his fingernails, his hand, was pressing into the palm and his fingernails were trying to drive their way right through his palm like this. Ouch, very painful. What Ramachandran did was he set up a mirror box such as this. And so you put the stub into the mirror box and then you can't see. It gets hidden. But you do see your, your elbow sticking out of there. And then you put your other hand on this side. And you impersonate with your right hand, the good hand, as much as possible what you see or what it feels like in the left hand. And then you look in the mirror, and it looks like you have two arms. And then what Ramachandra did is he got the fellow to open his hand. Slowly do this. And what happened is the guy became very excited because all of a sudden he says, it feels like this has happened. 
wow, right? Unfortunately, when the fellow pulled his arm out of the mirror box, all of a sudden it felt like this had happened. Mm -hmm. Rama Shandran sent this fellow home with his mirror box and said, keep on practicing. The guy kept on practicing. About a month later, I believe it was, I can't remember the exact amount of time, but a month later, the guy kept on practicing this in the mirror box all the time. His other hand would open up in the mirror box, and all of a sudden one day, his hand stayed. Interpretation, the plasticity of the brain. The pain that people experience are not necessarily what you are stuck with. And so when we are dealing with clients who are in chronic pain, it's a very slow process to help them regain some of life. Okay? We may never be able to, well, I'm going to talk about that in a moment. <clears throat> Quite often we get to a place where instead of talking about a cure. We can't give a cure anymore. Don't know why. Don't know why. But we start talking about pain management. We start talking about regaining some of your life back. I put this picture in here of Einstein because he said something to the effect of you can't solve a problem the same way the problem was created. Sometimes you have to think a little out of the box. And it's the same with pain, is that we have to gently guide our clients to be able to slowly find small little bits of life they can take back. They may not go back to their original life, but they can take back parts of their life. Okay? We don't know why pain is there. The cause is complex. Food, stress, depression, body position, weather, food, water, unexplained medical issues. Arrows in the back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So here's the big one that everyone has primarily come for. say that I have my ABCDEFs here of pain management and then I also separate because I think that pacing is probably the most important concept that I try to get across to my clients. Pacing like So, what does pacing look like? Has anyone seen The Matrix? Lots of people have seen Matrix. Do you remember the first uh, episode of the Matrix where Morpheus is in the fake Matrix with Neo and he says, this is what we are to the machines. Do you remember what he pulled up? Battery. A copper top battery. He says, this is what we are to the machines. And I love that analogy in explaining pacing. Okay? So this is what we have here. We have the copper top battery. They even went with Duracell. How's that, for, how's that for a pitch for Duracell? <laughs> People who do not have chronic pain, who do not have chronic illness, who aren't ill, period. Basically what we are looking at is we have energy. We have energy to burn. 16 hours worth on average. And then we need to recharge this thing. We call that sleep. Uh, so we sleep for about 8 of the 24 hours, and then we're active for about 16 of those 24 hours. Mm -mm. Problem. What happens when we're ill? What happens when we are having chronic pain? What happens when we have chronic illness? We don't get this. So I'm going to pick some arbitrary numbers here. By no means are these numbers supposed to fit those people who have chronic pain here, okay? 
but I'm just going to give you some examples here. So here's a 16-hour battery. And here we are, a person who has chronic pain, and they have an 8-hour battery. Here's the problem with the 8-hour battery. You're living in a 16-hour day. You're expected to perform in a 16-hour day. It's almost impossible. And so what I encourage people to do is, what I try to get across is this concept. We want to do a little bit of work. Then we want to take a break. Then we want to do a little bit of work. Then we want to take a break. Then we want to do a little bit of work. Then we want to take a break. Then we want to do a little bit of work. Take a break. Work, break, work, break, work, break. Of course, trying to convince your employer of that is a whole different ball of wax, but this is what we are attempting to do with pacing. And if we do this, then each time we take a little break, we inadvertently are giving ourselves this little recharge. Okay? And so, by working a bit and then taking a little break, we then may end up with a battery that goes a total of 12 hours. Now again, arbitrary numbers. We might have a battery that goes for 12 hours with lots of little breaks in between. Okay? Sounds easy, huh? <laughs> Not quite so easy. Because there are two things that one needs to be aware of. Number one, I said this. I said, you work a little bit, you take a break. You work a little bit, you take a break. You work a little bit, you take a break. Here's a question for you. Of the food that you take in, of the energy that comes from that food, how much of it goes to the neck up and how much of it goes to the rest of the body? Any guesses? So, oh, he's got a guess. Perfect. Actually, turn that around. The brain, the numbers that I have heard is that the brain takes anywhere from 50 to 70 percent of the energy that you take in. The rest of it goes to the rest of your body. So when I talk about when I talk about work a little bit, then take a break, work a little bit, you have to realize you are expending huge amounts of energy right now just trying to comprehend what the heck I am saying. Right? It takes energy to be alert, awake, and all this kind of stuff. It also takes energy to do work. But it takes energy to do your taxes. It takes energy to interact with people. Right? And so one of the things that we have to really be aware of is you're not pacing your work. You're pacing your energy. Right? That's one of the caveats. Another caveat is for people who have chronic pain. So you have chronic pain, just as an example. All right? Okay, well, I'll just answer this question for me. Okay, just for, for a little bit. How long did you go in life before chronic pain affected you? 37 and a half years. 37 and a half years. 37 and a half years. <laughs> this individual has lived with this battery. And now all of a sudden, I'm going to come along to her and say, nope, sorry, you don't get that battery no more. You get a choice. This one or this one. What am I asking? I'm to some degree asking for a complete personality change. Yeah. It's not easy. It's not easy. It sounds really easy. It's easy for me to spit the stuff out. It's easy to spit it out to clients trying to get people to realize this. It's not easy. You've been living in this body, and the rest of the world lives in this body. <coughs> and now all of a sudden you're saying, you have a choice. But then again, I will say to my clients, you have a choice. I'm not going to give you this one anymore. Sorry, you don't get it no more. But you get a choice. And again, like I say, these are arbitrary numbers. What do you want? Eight hours or twelve hours? It's a rhetorical question, of course. <coughs> Our ever ready buddy. <laughs> Trump. 
tried to stop, but I just kept going and going and going. And, uh... Okay. So we take a look at pacing, and we basically basically classify pacing into <laughs> three basic strategies. <laughs> So we have activity up here, we have relaxation down here. We have the first one, which is wait until. So we work, 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 until the pain just overcomes us and we completely collapse. Wait until the pain makes us stop. All right? Then the next one is, is we have something that I call the boom and bust cycle. And that is we work until the pain signal starts up. And we use the pain signal as the signal to stop working and we take a break then. Break. Then once we've relaxed a little bit, then we get up again, we do some more work. Again, remember this is an energy expenditure. We do some more work and we wait until the pain signal becomes prominent enough and then we take another break. And then we work, break, work, break. The problem with that strategy though is that the work becomes less and less and less and the downtime becomes more and more and more. So when we talk <coughs> about pacing, what do we suggest? We suggest starting here and slowly taking steps back to trying to find you know, what we would call it, some form of normalcy. I'm not exactly sure what the right word would be. So we start at below your average, below what you can do right now. All right? And generally, we pick a number called 80% of what you can do right now. Sorry, sorry. We start there. And we do our day at 80% of what our battery is giving us right now, all right? And instead of waiting for the pain signal, we take regular breaks. And everyone is going to be different. Maybe you're going to need a 15-minute break every hour. Maybe you're going to need a 15-minute break every 15 minutes. I don't know, all right? So we, we stay at this level for a while just to become acclimatized to a certain level we take regular breaks. We don't use pain as a signal. We use the clock as a signal to go take a break. And then once we've acclimatized to this level, we bump it up just a tiny little bit. So maybe from 80, we go up to 85% of what you are capable of. Right? And bump it up a little bit. And then, after we've acclimatized to that level, again, we're still taking these regular breaks. And then we might bump it up a little bit more. The interesting thing is, is that generally if, if I can convince a person to do this, I can get them to go beyond where they started at the 100% mark. They can go beyond the 100% of where they started. But it takes a lot of work trying to convince them to pace it. Yeah, sorry, I, I wanted to give one example. I had a woman who came in and she complained to me that her pain was so bad that she couldn't even complete washing the dishes. Right? Um, and you've got to think, what does washing the dishes look like? It looks like leaning over like this, sort of face, leaning over like this and washing dishes, right? You're not going to stand up straight like this and wash dishes because you're going to be soaked if you do that. So you're going to lean over a little bit. She had pain, back pain. And so I suggested this to her. And I suggested, okay, tell you what, here's what we'll do. Wash the plates. Sit down and watch 15 minutes worth of TV. Get back up, wash your cutlery. Sit back down, watch 15 minutes worth of TV. Get back up, wash the pots and pans. Sit down, get back up, lean off the countertop. She came back a week later and she said, I can't believe it. I made it through a whole washing of dishes. Not only that, but I had energy left over to go to two loads of laundry. She couldn't even make it through just the dishes, and she got to two loads of laundry within one week. Just by regular pace. Okay? 
Okay. Here's another one. Acceptance. The good old serenity prayer. Back to the serenity to accept things that I cannot change. The courage to change the things that I can. And the wisdom to know the difference. Another one of my favorites is, I paraphrase the Buddhist. This is not the Buddhist phrase. I don't quite know what it is. But it goes something like this. It goes something like, in life, pain is mandatory. Suffering is optional. So, what do I typically see my clients do? Typically what I see my clients doing is they are spending all this time here going to doctors, looking for the next cure, all these different things that they are doing that are pain-focused activities. And then, they have a little bit of time left over over here for the rest of their life. And I try to encourage my clients, let's switch that around. Let's switch that around. Let's spend this much time living your life, and I don't want to take away hope. I don't want to take away hope. Hope is a very important part of our life. And so it is important that you expend a little bit of energy going to the next doctor, going to the next miracle cure, etc., etc. But at the same time, it's also important to accept your life and what you have right now. So acceptance in my terms does not mean giving up. In my terms, acceptance means appropriate expenditure of energy. All right? We don't want to give up hope. So, write down some nasty questions and some nasty comments because at the end here we'll allow you to make some nasty comments and nasty questions, okay? All right, here we go. Next one. The B in the ABCDES stands for breathing and relaxation. One of the things that we look at is full lung capacity is about six liters. Normal breath that we would take is about one and a half liters. Uh, bottom third of your lungs, if you divide your lungs up into thirds, bottom third of your lungs contain twice, or sorry, ten times as many blood vessels as does the upper third. And yet, typically, when we breathe, we do breathe from the upper half of your lungs. So, one of the things that we will try to teach our clients is something called the diaphragmatic breath. If you can convince them into breathing diaphragmatically, great. However, I find that trying to teach diaphragmatic breathing is extremely difficult. And so one of the things that I encourage people to do is just breathe a little slower and a little deeper. So people with pain typically breathe like this. And they hold their breath. And that, unfortunately, is not conducive to relaxation. That, unfortunately, is not conducive to pain management. The other group of people that I get are the anxious people. And they breathe like this. <laughs> so they hyperventilate. Right? People are either holding their breath or they're hyperventilating. None of these strategies are actually conducive to relaxation and to reducing pain. So what I encourage people is if you have pain, then if this is a normal breath, then I encourage people to do something a little slower and a little deeper. It might look like this. Some people have referred to that as a sigh, and I go, yes, do more sigh. If you can convince people to do diaphragmatic breathing, it's difficult to teach. But diaphragmatic breathing, as you can see from this, all the blood vessels down there, all that oxygen is really good for the pain. If you can convince people to do diaphragmatic breathing, it would look like this. All happens down here in the stomach. That's hard to teach people. So, what do 
we doing by doing uh, slower deeper breaths? We're increasing the oxygen, we're increasing the relaxation, we're reducing muscle spasms, and we're reducing good stuff to breathe. I had one fellow who came in, this was quite a while ago, and this is sort of what his C stands for cognition, or simple word is thinking. What do you think? And this is basically his view, his thoughts of what his world looked like. He basically said, well, I got my kids, I got my wife, that's pretty good. I don't got my job, I got a lot of pain, I can't sleep. And his biggest complaint was, I can't play hockey, I can't go out. And so I worked with him for a while and I said, okay, so let's see if we can't alter your thinking a little bit. Right? Let's see if we can't take a look at what does this look like if we alter thinking a little bit. So we take a look at it. So what do we have time to do now? Now, before I was so busy, I didn't have time to go visit some of these friends that I have. Now I'll see they have time to go visit friends. Before he was so busy, he didn't have time to read the books that he wanted to read. Now he had time to read the books. And then, of course, his biggest complaint was the hockey. And I said, well, you're right. You can't play hockey right now. But that doesn't mean you have to give up on the team. The team needs a coach. The team needs somebody to do their advertising for them, something like that. Well, that, but I said, he also got kids. How do the kids feel? Because one of the things that he said is that typically when he played hockey, he was playing hockey in one arena, his kids were playing at the exact same time in another arena. Very seldom did he actually see his kids play. And I said, well, how do the kids feel when you're there watching, cheering them on? He said, oh, I feel great, yeah. And now you get to be the biggest supporter of hockey. You don't have to get the hockey up, you just have to redefine the hockey. And so, this is the hockey. We as clinical counselors do a lot of this kind of work, trying to alter perceptions, trying to find a little more hope in them, trying to find some positives. It's a tough job. What else we got? D stands for, oh no, we got a little comic first. What's this? Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> stands for distraction, and there are three basic types of distraction that we talk about. Um, we have physical distraction. What happens with distraction is that basically you are setting up a competing signal to the electrochemical signal that you interpret as, as pain. You're setting up a competing signal. And so one of the things that quite commonly happens is we stub our toe. After we've jumped up and down and done a whole lot of cursing, what do we typically do? You rub it. What are you doing by rubbing your toe? You're setting up a competing signal, a competing signal of touch that competes with that signal of pain, and the brain starts to reduce the pain. So physical uh, distraction is useful. Things like stretching, massage, heat or ice. Some people do really well with heat and lousy with ice, and some people do really well with ice and not with heat, and some people like to use both. People with pain are going to have to figure that out with themselves. Tens, acupuncture, ointments such as tiger bomb, etc., etc. So that's physical distraction. Oh yes, here's a good way of physically distracting. <laughs> We have social distraction. <coughs> Connecting with something bigger than yourself. Connecting with something bigger than your pain helps provide signals that compete with those pain signals. <coughs> so, time to connect with old friends, join a club, join a pain support group. 
don't feel so wrong. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Okay? Volunteer, help others who need support. And last but not least is mental distraction. Anxiety, what you focus on expands. If you focus, you sit in a dark room alone, focusing on your pain, what's going to happen? If instead you become totally obsessed with a crossword puzzle or Sudoku or hobbies, numerous different strategies, then you set up this competing signal to the pain. Norman Cousins wrote a book, and I can't remember what the book is called anymore, but basically what he talked about was how he cured his cancer by laughter. One of the things that laughter does, well, a couple of things that laughter does is it releases endorphins. Endorphins are your brain's very own happy slash pain killing chemicals. Useful little chemicals to have. So laughter is good for releasing those. Also increases oxygen intake, reduces stress, and of course it distracts you from your pain. So laughter, watching funny TV shows. I don't know. What does he do for a minute? Hey? Enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I talk about is exercise. How many people have ever had a cast or had a friend who had a cast on? Just about everybody knows, right? And you will notice, you know, people were signing the cast and all this kind of stuff, and for six weeks they had the cast on and walking around like this, and it was all cool and all this kind of stuff. And then they took the cast off, what did you see? <laughs> right? This skinny little leg or skinny little arm is in there. What happened? Well, basically the body said, you know, normally I need a certain amount of muscle power here. But now all of a sudden I have a cast that is taking all that stress and so I don't need so much muscle. So I'll put the energy into a different area of my body. It says, gee, because I don't have so much muscle, I don't need so much blood and nutrients and oxygen in that particular area. So I'll put the energy in other areas of the body. And so what you have is you have this shrinkage. Well, the same thing is happens that if you have chronic pain and you sit, what's going to happen is you're going to have muscle body deterioration. So you want to do some light exercise, light stretching. This helps keep you mobile, it increases muscle strength, it increases flexibility, it increases blood supply, it decreases most inflammation and all these other things. It decreases the risk of injury. Here's another place where endorphins come in. The second major place where endorphins are released are is exercise. So another good place to be but please remember, I like exercise. I have a little bit, I have a tendency to be a little bit of a nut, and I sometimes go over the board when I go exercise. F stands for food and water. Being aware that certain things can promote pain and some things can help reduce pain. Sugar increases most people's sensitivity. Some people have what are called chemical sensitivities. Chemical sensitivities, the best way that I can explain it would be it's sort of like an allergy to particular chemicals and substances. So the most common chemical sensitivities would be meat, nightshades, certain perfumes, some people with milk, and these kinds of things. I know myself, there happens to be one um, fragrance of perfume. I, I like most perfumes, must be one fragrance that for some reason gives me headaches. Um, some food and supplements increase relaxation and all these kinds of things. So generally those are considered to be the multivitamins, the fish oils, the vitamin Bs, the vitamin Cs. But you can look into some of the foods and supplements that might help. Water. Water helps increase the body's ability to excrete toxins. Some of those toxins are created by the pain. And 
it also increases your body's lubrication. So the old saying, eight to eight ounce glasses of water a day, really useful for when you have pain and trying to manage it. What else we got here? So here are some other options. One of the things that I'm not covering here today is sleep hygiene. It is a whole separate presentation that I do. Uh, so making sleep a priority because we know how much sleep and pain are intertwined between each other. So, uh, and then a variety of other ideas like appropriate posture, uh, medications, physiotherapy, chiropractic, acupuncture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Also, I have to be the bad guy and say reduce things like caffeine, nicotine, sugar, alcohol, all these kind of things because they are likely to go on increase pain. Okay. I know I'm such a bad guy. So, if I were to build a platform that went from this building over here over to that building over there, we actually have a psychological study. If anybody remembers the psychological study, you can cue me to it. I can't remember the psychological study. They did this with kids. If I were to build a platform from here to that building over there, right on the seventh floor. Well, it was made of plexiglass, so it was completely clear. And if I drove a car across it, just to show you that it's completely safe, my question is, is would you take that step out? You would. How many others would? Yeah, exactly. Why are you paying your electricity bill? See? And the thing that I'm trying to get at here is everything that I've covered up until this point, that was the easy stuff. That was the easy stuff. Here's the hard stuff. You can't see pain. You can't see pain. A person comes in with pain, they walk in. They look healthy. You can't see it. Right? And so we talk about something <laughs> called the stigma of pain. And I thank uh, Dr. Williamson out at uh, Surrey Memorial for prompting me to talk a little bit about this. I had a client who came in who very poignantly demonstrated or told me about the stigma of pain. My client is very disabled right here, and she happened to be feeling good one day, and she decided to go to a matinee with a friend. The friend also has minor pain. friend got a discount because they're disabled. My client, who could not see her disability, got a discount. You can't see the pain, and so you're left with this stigma, which we're going to talk about here. And the stigma is, what do I do about this? Do I expose myself as having pain, or do I keep it quiet? And here's why we might want to keep it quiet. There's a lady by the name of Patricia Reed. I believe she did her study in, at U of A, where I did my PhD. And she looked at the stigma of pain. And she had about, I think it was about 150 people, most of whom were suffering from osteoarthritis, but they had other various forms of pain as well. And she took a look at their perspectives of what's happening out there and what kind of stigma they are faced with. And so these people are saying that 73% of other people think chronic pain is an excuse to get pain medications. Well, other people think that a person taking pain medications is a drug addict. 70%. Other people think that Having chronic pain is a sign of weakness, almost 60%. Now. 
other people think that it's your fault. It's your fault if you don't get better. Really? Almost 60%. All I can say to that is ouch. Or get less respect from family members. 35%. Here's the one that really hurts. People who you really count on, be supportive. The doctors. I <clears throat> think that chronic pain patients exaggerate their symptoms. Two thirds. Doctors think that chronic pain patients So is it, is it any wonder that people who have chronic pain either have one of two problems? The second one being more common. The first one is, is being over-medicated. Doctors who don't understand chronic pain. And the second, which is much more common, which is chronic pain, people are quite often under-medicated because the doctors are so fearful of opiates. Would you attest to that? So what do we do? And the big message is, is that when you're faced with the stigma, is you really need to go out there and advocate for yourself. You need to identify the stigmatization. And one of the big things that I put out is join a support group. Learn some assertiveness training. Teach your clients assertiveness. Teach them how to have a voice. Teach them not only how to have a voice, but also teach them how to have a collective voice. That's where the support groups become so important. Because in the end, we want to start educating our healthcare professionals. We want to start educating our politicians. People in Pain Network, wonderful organization, brand new? Mm -hmm. Pretty new, huh? Seven months, not a year yet. Yes. We have a <coughs> here um, what you call yourself, director of? Mm -hmm. Originator of? CEO, founder, CEO, 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 sure. Mm -hmm. sure. CEO of the People in Pain. So if you want to know a little bit about People in Pain, Heather has a wonderful resource to go talk to. Hopefully I'm going to make it to I cut my holiday short, especially for you. Oh, thank you. This is research on carbon Yes. Yeah. Um, People in Pain has a wonderful little uh, booklet uh, that you can read. Uh, what's it called again? The. We oh, even have a list. Yeah, I have some with me. Oh, I can't give them away tonight, but you can certainly. I have some you can have a look at. Yes. So, by the way, this was not staged. Heather was a complete surprise to me. I just wanted to hear what you what you what you're saying and <coughs> what you what you uh, want to do about right them. Okay, pain we see. Uh, who else we got? We have the one that's in really tiny print here. You have an entire manual that you can download for free there. Uh, you have to download it in pieces, but you have uh, a manual you can download. There is something called uh, Breakthrough Pain by Shin Sun Young, that's a CD. And then, there's a really cool book out there. It's called The Mindful Way Through Depression. Anybody use that book? Yay! Yay! <laughs> exactly. Great little book. And you're going like, why am I advertising The Mindful Way Through Depression? And the reason why is because A, it's a good book. It helps people with chronic pain or quite often also struggling a little bit with their moods. And so this is a great book for that. Plus, the added benefit is you get this wonderful CD by John Kabat-Zinn at the end. It's a mindfulness CD, it's a wonderful CD, and so it comes free with the book. What a deal. You can buy his other books if you want, but then you have to buy a CD separate, right? All right, and of course everyone knows Kate Warwick. 
I, I, I want to finish off here <clears throat> by asking people's impression of me. What do you think? What do you see up here? You see a guy who's bouncing around and all this and kind of happy and all this kind of stuff? If you try to follow me down the ski hill, you're going to have some difficulties. I've been living with chronic pain since my mid 30s, about 20 years ago. Now, my chronic pain is nothing near what Heather is experiencing. But to some degree, and Heather as well, is a testament to the fact that we walk our talk. We walk our talk. If I don't take care of myself, if I don't do my ABCs, my pain. I'm going to guess, because you know, we hate these 10 point scales, but I'm going to make a guess and say another one, 6 out of 10, if I'm not taking care of myself, if I don't sleep right, if I don't, if I eat a little pot of junk food. If I'm taking care of myself normally, I'm sitting in around the two. Right now, I'm a little stressed sitting out here in front of you guys. <laughs> I'm sitting out about maybe a three. So it's really important to be very compassionate with your clients. Believe them, move slow. What they really need is somebody in their corner. So believe them. Okay, I think with that I'm gonna call it quits. We're gonna turn the camera.